THE SMUGGLER'S FATE by William Theodore Parks Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. A seaside idol this, to teach how oft amiss Doth fall the fate of men who would be free. It makes me cry hey-ho, in minor cadence low, When I do mind me of the fate of three to shun hymeneal perils and tired of mashing girls a smuggler's cave they took beside the sea and formed a reckless crew that swallowed their own brew of whiskey punch and coffee beer and tea but most of beer and whiskey as you see and that's the reason that i cry hey ho they wrestled with the wave then ran into their cave but telescopes above were taking stock thus fate was on their track and soon alas alack the smiles of fate fell on them from the rock thus mesmerized by mirth they climbed the rocks and earth with fascinated recklessness alack my sympathy to show again i say hi ho twere better to their cave they had gone back ah me the smugglers three were blind their fate to see and lo capitulation followed soon for spite of all their pains they soon were in the chains that fettered them in bondage neath the moon that shone on double case of treble spoon two like the moon that wanes and that is why i sing in minor tune and cry again with sympathy high ho thus ever day by day in bondage still they lay surrendering provisions and their brew until the crew did go into the town and lo a parson had some triple work to do their captives now hard labor is their due alack the hapless crew i cry again with sympathy hi ho end of poem this recording is in the public domain the late viz binks by william theodore parks read for librivox dot org by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c it was about an hour they call the small and the mysterious an hour when in the ghosts are wont to take their constitutional twas twenty-four o'clock an hour that's oft times delirious to many a liver wetted swell pugnacious or emotional the beggared corporation lights did flick in the nor'wester gale that blistering nose and fingertips were loaded well with sleet when binks harangued a constable good night it's cold you're looking pale from where he backed a lamp-post at the end of brunswick street ah sergeant says fizz binks it's late or i could treat you decently and twouldn't be too dusty if we had a flying drink but chap a vic is strict they passed in parliament so recently the bobby was a thirsty one he winked a thirsty wink ha ha said binks you know the lines so don't be too particular there's some back door that's open said the constable you're right just move and there throw yonder lane and hide up perpendicular beyond the lamp i'll folly when there's nobody in sight the thing was managed gracefully and with an open sesame the constable had stolen to a quiet bar with binks produced a clay said he i hope your honor won't think less of me to pull a pipe by jove i don't said binks and brought the drinks the moment was so contraband it gave unto the liquor bar a zest he asked the constable to take another neat 
but lifting out his ticker says the bobby well be quick or gar the sergeant might come whoop on me he's out upon his beat the constable decanted it said he hold on until i look now fly said he and why they dived again into the night he fished from out his overcoat and deftly in his mouth he stuck a friendly lump of orris root to make his breath all right that bobby was a wily one the act was rather opportune for they had scarcely managed to get halfway up the gut when he was made aware that he must coin a whited whopper soon for hark it was the tramping of the sergeant's heavy foot said he we must dissemble or i'm ruined and a shapeable excuse i'll have to make what brings the two of you down here i'm making just a prisoner sir he's drunk and he's incapable exclaimed the bobby gripping brinks just under bink's ear twas somewhat ominous for brinks though he protested not he chewed the cud of thought until he saw that surgeon out of sight he had not comprehended yet the patronizing turpitude of bobbies who will take a treat well now said he good night but spake that constable said he good night is best for you you see but it won't answer now for me i darn let you go it's quietly and easily and decently you'll come with me you're drunk and you're incapable i told the sergeant so fitzbank fell plump in mire of dote twas shocking thus to realize such treachery and superfuge of ingrant sneak of sin but sixty x was bigger in his figure by a deal of size and little binks was little so the bobby ran him in the sergeant he who took the charge was grave and stayed particular he entered binks upon his book and sent him to the cell and binks did forfeit half a sov for standing perpendicular before the beak and leaving court he cursed that bobby well he said the act was scandalous and of the gutter order he that bobby was a whist ye see and hold your tongue shut up it's fond of me you ought to be if i swore ye wore disorderly it would have cost ye extra or you'd maybe be put up it used to be sermonizing habit and methodical to tag a moral story with a warning at its end and bobby entertainments in the midnight might be quotical so leave him to his duty if you keep him as a friend end of poem this recording is in the public domain a fugitive kiss by william theodore parks read for LibriVox.org by vincenzo vipont a fugitive kiss i was on the carpet kneeling and fondly and with feeling i pressed her metacarpus to my oscillating lip when flexor and extensor of stern parental censor incontinent did greet me and took me near the hip i rolled into the fender with broken silk suspender and mode of movement sharp as her pater gave the tip he didn't back the winner for sport was not his grip the above brief but touching confession of disastrous failure recorded by timothy pipkins a sporting student of st jago's hospital is indicative of the nemesis from an offended fate that frequently foils the improvident hunter of matrimonial adventure end of poem this recording is in the public domain. The Bedroom's Curse and the Murdered Cockatoo by William Theodore Parks Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, 
B.C. Tim Doolin was a well-known jock, an active sprite, and light and trim, and time there was that jocks did funk to mount and run the race with him. He won by length, he won by head, he saved the race by nose and ear, till all the jocks around their pints exclaimed the thing was devilish queer. But fortune is a gay coquette, by fickle fortune Doolin lost, till every one who backed him soon did find him out a fraud and frost. I've seen him lose at Punchtown, I've seen him last at Battle too. At Fairy House I've seen him fall, his colors then were black and blue. He stood and scratched his head amain, beside the stable door one night he had been drinking tints of malt and felt as he were almost tight a race was on to run next day he trotted up his chance to win when turning through the stable door he saw a gentleman within he thought the thing extremely strange and asked the man why he was there and stoutly gave the hint that he was there to sneak and dose the mare the gentleman he laughed a laugh i've backed the beast myself by gum and you must win or i will be the loser of a tidy sum well look said doolin pawn me scowl i have my doubts that she's in form the stranger glared at doolin and with voice as of a rising storm accused the jock of practices that were not meant for honest men and asked him how he won so oft and could not pass the post again well yes your honour pawn me faith it puzzles me the same as you that i can't jerk the horse ahead and win as once i used to do i never drink before the race i always pray before i mount and yet i find it's all the same my prayers have come to no account i used to curse and swear but ah bedad my swearing days are done then how on earth could you expect to be the man who could get on i may not dare to curse and swear i have a rich religious aunt i'm in her will and would lose the fortune if i did and shan't she often heard me curse and swear but warning me one day says she if you go on to curse and swear i'll have no more to do with thee i've made my will and left you all my worldly goods and money too i've got it written signed and sealed so you be careful what you do i promised her upon my oath that i would neither curse nor swear and i have kept my word and i will keep my word to her so there she lent me a cockatoo and cautioned me i must not lack to treat him well he's in the room i occupy till she comes back ah uh, that indeed were here's a tip when in the morning you get up keep cursing all the time you dress and swear at night before you sup by this no human ear will catch the oathings that will make you light and take a load from off your mind and you will win the race good night that very night when he went home he slyly locked the bedroom door and up and down around the room he scattered curses and he swore he cursed before he cursed behind he cursed until his face was red by dint of cursing and at last he stripped and tumbled into bed next morning many oaths he made and sandwiched them with many a curse that sounded weird and wry and strange his oathings they could not possibly be worse he cursed because he had to rise he cursed to leave the bed so nice and warm and soft he cursed because the water was as cold as ice he cursed around the basin stand he cursed the water jug alas the towel and soap he cursed with oath that almost broke the glass 
He cursed a button that was loose, he cursed the thread and needle new, he cursed the irritating starch, he cursed his washerwoman too. He curbed his braces, they were tied with bits of string that broke in twain. He fixed them with a pin, it stuck into his spine. He cursed again. He cursed the postman for his knock, twas by his tailor he was sent. He cursed the landlady who brought the bill and asked him for the rent. Before, behind, above, below, at right or left, he was not loath to drop a detonating curse or fling an alternating oath. He cursed the razor and the strop, he cursed the wart upon his nose, he cursed his hair that wouldn't grow, he cursed the corns upon his toes. He cursed a stud and buttonhole that was too big and in the street. He saw a burly constable and cursed the man upon his beat. He cursed the helmet on his head, the number on his collar too. He cursed the stripe upon his arm, his mittens and his suit of blue. He cursed his baton right and left, he cursed it also upside down. He cursed him to the country jail and back again and into town. He cursed the lining of his sleeve, a bottle in his pocket who had put in there he could not tell. He cursed his aunt, her cockatoo. He cursed the laces of his boots, the cockatoo he cursed again. Again he swore, unlocked the door, and gaily started for the train. Hurrah, he won the race that day, and everything for him went right. And surreptitiously he cursed and swore, and cursed again that night. A painful, shocking thing that men should stoop to acts like this, for fame or pelf. Though all my friends there's not a man who would act so shocking but himself. His calendar grew bright again with fortune's sunlight or a cast. But there must be an end to such, and retribution comes at last. His aunt returned to town again, he gave her back her cockatoo. T'were better he had slain him first, it's what I think, and so will you. One day a mortuary note did come, alas, his aunt was dead. He buried her with decent haste, and then her latest will was read. But by that testament he found that he had not been left her purse. It intimidated this that he had taught her cockadoo to curse. It intimidated this that she, though that, had met her death, alas, and in a codicidal expressed a wish they'd send the bird to grass. No mortal eye but his beheld the deed he then essayed to do. Twas murder, for he wrung the neck of his dead aunt, her cockatoo. No mortal eye beheld the deed, but things again with him went queer. Till one day, looking down the street, he saw a stranger prowling near. The man who told him thus to swear, twas on a dark November eve. He knew that stranger held a secret stone for him inside his sleeve. He knew that he had run a score of heavy debt, was due for sin. And darting back, he closed the door, said he to Bridget, I'm not in. Just say that I'm out, said he, and quickly up the stairs he flew. The stranger knocked, ah, let me see, and up the stairs he mounted too. The servant sneaked the keyhole then, and saw a struggle on the bed, then ran below, Mavron, a store, come up, our God, the lodger's dead. The moral is of gentlemen, you do not know you should beware, you should not use your bedroom for a hiding place to curse and swear. To curse a harmless constable upon his beat is even worse. Twas he who caught the juryman, who gave the verdict on his course. That shocking room is haunted now, it may not raise a shock in you. 
but every dark november eve there comes a shrouded cockatoo and gliding in his pallid shirt a wretched spectre doth rehearse the record of his oathings dire the cockatoo then shrieks a curse the man of easy habits then will see the deadly deed anew of how the neck was wrung by him who slew his aunt her cockatoo the man of easy habits then will see the evil sprite of gloom come prowling for his guilty soul and bear it down the trap of doom the lady can never make the lodgers in that room consent they never stay beyond the day that she has asked them for the rent but men are not so wicked now they will not swear an oath for pelf they much about the same as you almost exactly like myself end of poem this recording is in the public domain A Gun Solo by William Theodore Parks Read for LibriVox.org by Vincenzo Vipont A Gun Solo By a lonely dried-up fountain in a purple Irish mountain, my talk was interesting with the female of that spot. When she sprang from off my knees, for rasping through the trees, a bullet stopped our jesting. I started at the shot. It's my husband's gun, she murmured. I sauntered from the spot. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Semi Grand Piano by William Theodore Parks. Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. I was walking through the darkness of the pleasant town of Burr. Twas late and very lonely you could not hear a stir when turning round a corner i heard the music sweet of a sammy grand piano and a singing down the street you will say it's not uncommon to hear the pleasant sound of a sammy grand piano upon a midnight round but oh the silver music of the voice that mingled there with the sammy grand piano was wonderful and rare I waited on in rapture and hearkened to the strain. I paused until she finished and commenced the song again. And oh, the magic pathos of her voice was such, I'd say. I'd warble when she finished an Italian serenade. And so anon I warbled a heart-bewitching thrill, all in the friendly darkness beneath her window sill. I thought it might remind her of the troubadours of old, though twasn't too romantic, for the night was devilish cold. It wasn't all Italian, but it was much the same. It was a sweet impromptu, a song without a name. And if it doesn't bore you, I'll sing you just a verse. You'll say it might be better, but I think it might be worse. O oh, lady who was singing with happy semi-grand, a troubadour is waiting, he's asking for your hand. Carissima mia arga, from other lands I roam, be ready with the trousseau, I'll come and take you home. Recorder how I love you, this lay of mine will tell. A oh, willow, willow, worse through. Mavarone, I love you well. La ami, la amo, la antibus, refordu heller doom. Mean frolian, kusha bran agar, get up your traps and come. It wasn't all Italian, this song of mine you see. It wasn't like a trantatel, twasn't like a glee. Twas thought of on the spur it's thus that brightest songs are made i think that you'll agree with me twas a compo serenade i felt the song was working twas unmurrous and new twas making an impression a thing i always do 
as though the middle ages were back again in burr hark hark behind her lattice at last i heard a stir oh there's nothing like the feeling that passes through the mind when you know a lovely lady is pulling up her blind and my heart was all a flutter in that lonely street of burr when i heard the curtains rustle with the sylphid hand of her i saw the window open i saw a face scarce i heard a voice that muttered what are you doing there and over me was emptied a full and flowing can which made me hurry homewards a wet and wiser man i sang my song that midnight with voice of dulcet tone my dulcet voice next morning was like a bagpipe groan a blanket round my shoulders my feet were in a pan some doctor stuff beside me a sad and wiser man end of poem this recording is in the public domain Canty Crank by William Theodore Parks, read for LibriVox.org, by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. If you have aesthetic notions of the classic beauty rare, you would never for a moment say that nature took the prize for the elegance of figure or tint upon her hair. Of Mother Becca Canty Crank, you wouldn't like her eyes her nose you couldn't admirate her teeth are in a chippy state her voice is like a corn cake her manner like a knife a cutting way of dealing with sentimental feeling you wouldn't altogether care to choose her for a wife but ah she is the casket of a compensing excellence the odor of a sanctity particularly her own she knows she is without a doubt intensely moral out and out and so she sits in judgment on a self-constructed throne a censor of corruptness of nature in voluptuousness she rails in holy horror with a perantic rage that beauty's form is shocking in semi raiment mocking her own upholstered scragginess in picture or on stage her loathing is the ballet for lo from court and alley the thousand cinderellas are fairy clad and bright a dire deed of sinning by dint of beauty winning their bread then by the needle in the murky candlelight o mother becca canty crank the ways of earth are very rank but women live by beauty intelligence and toil and toil is overcrowded ma'am intelligence is got by cram and what's for lovely sally of the garret shall she spoil no pray for her and set her as toiler for the sweater or freeze her in the winter or your doorstep in the street with penance to her bones by whitening up the stones that you may moil her handiwork with smirch of dirty feet or pray for her and crape her as vestal to the draper to do the woeful penance of canty cranks to please till worn out and weary unto her bedroom eerie she staggers up at midnight then bring her to her knees do anything but let her enjoy a way to better the miserable midnight of her life into the day of brighter fortune's light a crush her back to night and teach her how to thank you by kneeling down to pray yes hound away the ballet destroy the chance of sally for she has many prizes in the marriage market won by hippocratic prudity go boom the semi nudity of drawing-room and salon for the first and second son end of poem this recording is in the public domain
an ill wind blew him good by william theodore parks read for LibriVox.org by Libriscub. i was to the windward walking of love and marriage talking when zephyr like a feather took my topper on its wing and i hollowed and i hollowed while another fellow followed it stopped they came together with his foot upon the thing aesthetic oaths i uttered a threat for damage muttered and my popping of the question had also lifted wing she's wedded to another and now i cannot smother my blessing on that zephyr and that fugitive top hat for had i not been checked my happiness was wrecked I wouldn't be so rosy today and round and fat. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Kleptomaniac's Doom by William Theodore Parks. Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Lord of Masher dudum wore on his essenced curls a gold zone of strawberry leaves and rays with pips of pearls though he was called englishman his blood was persian blue which unto his complexion gave a gal if murray hue the earl of masher dudum he was just as he began he seemed in perpetuity a fossil lady's man and yet he wasn't what you'd call an absolute success he hankered to be more than most he wasn't he was less for he was poisoned with the grip of miser hungered greed and racking rent upon the screw he made his tenants bleed he loved his parson for he taught that gold was dross and scutch to men who of the sinful chink had not got over much he taught by unction's homily how really false the leaven of gold is to a tenant here compared with gold in heaven but man with base ingratitude is rife they did not bless the earl of masher dudum so he wasn't a success one day twas ruminating thus alone and in his club my politics do fail he said to fail a eh, there's the rub i was a high conservative i am what am i now an india rubber ball of wind a pinhole in my brow evaporated of my brain a shrunken rag and dust a something must be done i wot i whiz a something must he took a portly bottle up and from its tinseled neck he poured the buzzing nectar forth and without pause or wreck into his esophagus then decanting it straight away he lit a weed he was a man who never smoked a clay odds bokins to that liberal he swore in ancient guise of quainty oath he's more than i i wot for he is wise unto the lending and the light that gives to men a glim of what they know is just i'm but a farthing dip to him twas though his indignation he did make a vulgar slip and coin so rude a smile in re the farthing dip i find my brains have broken loose my occupants to let but ha i've got a last resort that none may wot of yet i'll take my diamond ring to-night and use it round his panes and in a mask i'll burger him and steal his liberal brains he quaffed the glorious viz again as swill both deep and strong nor witted he nor wotted he it was a lawless wrong to steal another's brains he then invested in some crape and putty thus to make his nose more liberal of shape 
he turned his coat its lining was of party colored trim and got a life preserver now i'll go and burgle him that night he sneaked the towpath o'er with serpentine device and round a postal pillar red he scouted slyly twice until on india rubber soles at length he reached the goal and up the garden wall he clomb and down the wall he stole then nodding on his mask of crape with spry ambition fain he slid and worked his diamond ring around the window pane he crept into the servant's hall no maid or cook was there he took his boots and gaiters off and climbed along the stair he sought to catch the banister to guide his pilot fist but headlong down the flight he fell the banister he missed and lo from every room above the shrieks of horror rose from girls in papered trusses bereft of daylight clothes and full for twenty minutes by the clock their cries increase of ho police and robbers high and murder o oh, police the butler fired a pistol shot the cook discharged a spit the boots let fly a bootjack and the footman all his kit the groom ran down the stagwell stairs with horsey o oh, things dire and constable came knocking said he are you's on fire he put his bull's eye on him ha we're here a putty case you needn't hide behind that putty nose upon your face i'm on the wanted tack for you a couple of months or three so don't you be disorderly move on and come with me they put him on his country and the evidence was queer but said his lordship solemnly the crime that we have here is rare in england just to prude a noble drinks and goes with mask of crape upon his eyes and putty on his nose to burgle certain premises but drink being in his head mistook the house attacked his own and burgled it instead now this is queer but i have here a very ancient law and from its context you will mark i this deduction draw that should a man by suicide attempt to sneak away from curses that grow thick on him we make the coward stay and if a man by putty nose and mask and diamond ring do burgle his own home is just a similar sort of thing and so unto the upper house for thy remaining years i sentence thee and with his wig the judge mopped up his tears end of poem this recording is in the public domain Caught in the Breach by William Theodore Parks Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Of fascinating parts he played with female hearts. T'was reprehensible, as you may guess. But still it was his way, continued he to play, Until a maiden asked him for redress, And folly bore the fruit of breach of promise suit. He owns a couple of thousand pounds the less, He's a sorry man today, he does confess, and the wily way of woman he does bless, and his pipe is all that he will now caress. He doesn't care to think of it, the mess. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Ghost of Hiram Smike by William Theodore Parks read for LibriVox.org by patrick seville she was a dainty lady with golden hair and cream of roses her complexion be like a charming dream her eyes were sapphire lighted her lips with peach and bloom pater of pearls were framing but in her heart a tomb for many loves they buried that cemetery below o oh, fie on it for ladies with love to trifle so at last unto a stranger 
her stony heart did strike. His wealth was most romantic, his name was Hiram Smike. Twas on her mother's sofa, he looked at her, said he, I'm kinder sweet on you, love, will you accept of me? I've travelled half this orange, and never saw your likes. I calculate your odder join the wigwams of the Smikes. His wealth was most romantic, she answered him with tact. Said he, I'm off to-morrow, my trunk is ready packed. I must be off to Frisco, to see my corn is barned. Don't worry in my absence, for if you do, I'm darned. Now play some tune that's proper, to show that you're engaged, expressive of your promise, and how your heart is caged. Strike up some soothing ballad, to tell how you'll be true, and I'll work in a chorus of Yankee doodle doo. Her fairy fingers wandered along the ivory keys of her new rosewood cottage like warble through the trees. She sang that she'd be faithful all in a soothing strain while he worked in a chorus and then he crossed the main. It was a level twelve months, a fortnight and a day since Hiram Smike departed and yet he stayed away. But she did wait no longer and they were back from church. It was the wedding breakfast, she's left him in the lurch. A health unto the bridegroom, and up they rose to drink. When hark, a cry was uttered that made the lady think. A voice of an old woman employed upon that day. To do some extra tending, look here, she said, I say. I guess you do not know me, because I've shaved my chin. I'm dressed like an old woman, but I'm a man within. I'm Hiram Smike, your lover, who left the Yankee shore. To come back here to wed you, I'm darn for evermore. You lifted me like thunder, but you shall never boast of how you jilted Hiram. I'm off to make a ghost. He said, tucked up his flounces and fluttering through the door, he left them all astounded, and he was seen no more. Next morning, in the daughter upon the city side, a man beheld the woman come floating down the tide, and far away in London. A bride and bridegroom fled. From their hotel at midnight, a ghost was round the bed. They sought a second lodging, but in the room as host, was waiting to receive them, that sad intruding ghost. They tried a cabman's shelter, but it was all in vain. That tantalizing spectre was by their sides again. I even in the daylight, in rotten row aloud, they heard an awful murmur like water through the crowd. A moan was from Neuralgia, did on each titan strike. His ghost is on the warpath, avenging Hiram Smike. They tried the penny steamboats, the railway underground, the buses and the tram cars, but still they always found that busy ghost around them, their lives could not be worse. Oh, thunder, shrieked the bridegroom, I'll see for a divorce. But when the court was opened, the judge refused to sit, for every pleading lawyer had got a sneezing fit and then there came the earthquake the ruddy sunsets came when lo quite unexpected when night they saw the flame a flash like a vesuvian did the table strike with a satanic whisper you're wanted hiram smike and from that curious moment there is no more to tell they're having every comfort i hear they're doing well end of poem this recording is in the public domain Why Did Ye Die? by William Theodore Parks Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Oh, Pat, the blush is on your face. You're white and cold. And still, I'm all alone and by your side Upon the bleak, damp hill. The beating from your heart is gone, The starlight from your eye. Mavrone Ashthor, O Pat Igra, Ara, why did ye die? A streak of blood is on your breast, And blood is on your brow. O let me die meself and rest, It's all I care for now. I want to go where you are gone, And in your grave to lie. A Pat Avron, I'm all alone, Ah, why did ye die? Me curse is on the men of Rick that brought you out this night. 
That took you off and made you me sick, That took you off and made me sick, And coaxed ye to the fight. O oh, sure twas wrong to give you life, And laugh your wife to cry. Ah, Pat, you should have stayed at home, Ah, why did you die? You wouldn't take me warm and pat, And shun the moonlight boys. A biddy wished wake out of that, Your dramin stop your noise. You've dragged the blankets off me, I'm jammed against the wall, And you're ballin' all for nothing, for I'm not dead at all. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Pretty Little Land I Know by William Theodore Parks Read for LibriVox.org by Queen Tiffany Rose A pretty little land I know, surrounded by the pearly spray, is where the emerald shamrocks grow, and fertile propagation. The great bear in the polar sky can see it at the fall of day, when peeping with his glistening eye towards Britain's mighty nation for when the sun is rolling down into the ocean for the night in all his radiant golden crown and purple fleckered rays while tucking on his dreamy cap inside the crimson curtains bright the great warm-hearted kingly chap looks back with loving gaze and where the shining waters dance across the wild atlantic deeps he takes a sudden pleasing glance and when the twilight cometh gray on other shores with coaxing glow he winks his eye before he sleeps upon that charming land i know that's jeweled in the pearly spray there lore of bravest deeds enshrine great phantoms of historic days their myrtle wreaths of memory twine o'er many story graves there many marble brows are bound by sculpture of the poet's bays the while their souls are still in sound from harp strings to the waves with glorious wealth of hair and curls and beauty real elating boys is there you'll find most darling girls in plentiful diffusion and cupid with his bow and darts his murderous perpetrating boys don't care at all what crowds of hearts he slays by love's delusion End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. How They Enlist by William Theodore Parks Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Two guardsmen and a Dublin boy were drinking in a bar. The Dublin boy was standing treat unto the men of war. And thus to one he speaketh so, the taller of the two, I wonder how men come to go and list. Now, how did you? The soldier grinned a stately grin in military style. He meant it for the Dublin boy as patronizing smile. It kind of sort like worries me. This was the cause of that. I always liked to feed on lean and couldn't bolt the fat. One day it was at dinner, see. A big disgusting lump of fat was dumped upon my plate i got the bloomin lump i merely took the thing upon my fork and with a sigh let my father have the fat wop in his bloomin eye a sign of partnership dissolved between my boss and me i took the shillin and became a guardsman as you see but there my appetite has been most tricky like and mean now i can eat a pound of fat and detest the lean End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Kindergarten Way by William Theodore Parks. Read for LibriVox.org by Vincenzo Vipond. The Kindergarten Way. In a perfumed orange grove adjacent to Cordova, I taught the English grammar unto a lady gay. The verb to oscillate, I taught to conjugate corporeally depicted in kindergarten way. But by eavesdropping trick, a caballero quick, 
with lapse of condescension, but where I may not mention, in dexter-handed flick, the Spanish verb to stick, corporeally inflicted in kindergarten way. The verb to do he did it, for Spanish laws forbid it, to translate free corporeally, the verb to love and practice it, upon the pupil tis unfit. To illustrate its active state, when passive hate behind a gate doth lie in wait, to teach the verb to suffer, in kindergarten way. He taught the verb to suffer, by imprompt sword display, I learnt the verb to suffer, and would not, could not stay, so left upon that day my fee he did not pay, his ingrate Spanish way. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. End of the Spook Ballads by William Theodore Parks.